Welcome. Ooh. Uh, we're pleased tonight to welcome uh, former U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services and Congressman Tom Price uh, to campus. Uh, pleased that Dean Baker has been able to join us to uh, lead this discussion. Uh, and I will introduce a formal, you'll have a formal introduction shortly. I just want to make a couple of announcements. Next Wednesday, May 2nd, we'll host a panel discussion on the pink wave, the surge of women running for office in 2018. It will be, it will uh, feature uh, former Senator Kelly Ayotte, who will be a uh, fel uh, visiting fellow on campus next week. And the discussion will be moderated by Amy Walters, the political, the national uh, editor of the Cook Political Report, who is also a member of the IOP advisory board. You can find out more about all of our upcoming events on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. Uh, we will open the floor for audience questions. There'll be a microphone in the center aisle. Please line up behind uh, the microphone. As usual, we will give priority uh, for the first three questions uh, to our students. Um, I will give you my normal admonition as well that a question uh, ends in a question mark. Uh, please make sure your phones are on silent. And now uh, to formally introduce our speaker is Will Cohen. Will is a second year from Naperville, uh, Illinois, studying biology. He has written for The Gate, which is our undergraduate political review, and he is on the board uh, of the College Republicans. Please join me in welcoming Will to the podium. We are incredibly excited to be welcoming Dr. Tom Price, former United States Secretary of Health and Human Services to the University of Chicago. From early in his career, Dr. Price has been focused on being a fixer. He started working with his hands using power tools, hammers, and nails. And now I know what you're all thinking, and you're right. He was an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> Dr. Price completed his medical school education and residency at the University of Michigan and Emory, and Emory University, respectively, and went on to run a successful practice in addition to an orthopedic clinic at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. Dr. Price's career as a physician prepared him well for what would become his signature policy area, health care. Upon being elected to the United, States Sec the United States House of Representatives in 2004, uh, representing the Georgia 6th District after several terms in the Georgia State Senate, Dr. Price became a passionate advocate for patient-centered health care reform, primarily through his Empowering Patients First Act, which served as an alternative to the Affordable Care Act. He was also chairman of the House, uh, House Budget Committee, where he supported proposals for a balanced federal budget. And prior to that, he was the chairman of the House Republican Policy Committee and Republican Study Committee. As a result, it was fitting that President Trump uh, chose Dr. Price to become his first Secretary of Health and Human Services. Upon confirmation, Dr. Price became the first HHS Secretary since the administration of George H.W. Bush to have a medical background. We are incredibly excited to hear from Dr. Price about his thoughts on what needs fixing in the American health care system and federal budget. Moderating the discussion will be Dr. Catherine uh, Dr. Catherine Baker, Dean and Emmett Dedman Professor at the Harris School of Public Policy. She is a leading scholar in the economic analysis of health policy, and her work has been published in journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, Science, and the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Price and Dean Baker. So, Secretary Price, it's wonderful to get to talk with you about the many issues facing our health care system, but I have to start with uh, asking you, in your work as a practicing physician, in your work in leadership in the House of Representatives, in the work, your work as a member of the administration, which populations are hardest to wrangle and which ones are most compliant? <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Dr. Baker, and, and first let me thank uh, the uh, IOP for the invitation, for the opportunity to, to be here and, and share some, uh, some words this evening, and it's great to see all of, the, uh, all of the folks here interested in something that's been a passion of mine for uh, my entire professional life, and that is uh, uh, health and our health care system. Um, uh, I started in solo practice, grew it into one of the largest private non-academic group practices in the country. I ended up in... Uh, when I left that practice in 2004 to run for the House of Representatives with 68 partners. Um, and I promise you that I never woke up any morning and said, boy, I wish I had 68 partners. <laughs> so uh, 
um, orthopedic surgeons are, uh, are an independent lot. Um, and uh, as uh, Tom Coburn wrote the book, I think, Herding Cats, uh, that's uh, that's kind of what that uh, that experience was like, but it, uh, it was all it was it was it was wonderful. And I enjoyed it immensely, but it's a challenge to organize docs. So uh, physicians play a really important role in steering patients through the healthcare system, and a lot of the health reforms that we see on the table aim to change the way we pay physicians to enlist their aid or to give them incentives to steer patients to high value care versus low sure. value care. What do you think is the right way to pay for health care, whether it's through insurance or not? Should it be based on the quantity of care, the quality of care? Are there innovative payment systems that would help us improve value? Yeah, this is an incredibly important issue because oftentimes when we talk about the challenges in health care, we're really talking about the challenges in health financing, not necessarily the challenges in health care. Um, and the same is true that, with it, that oftentimes we're talking about the health delivery system as opposed to the actual care itself that's being, that's being provided. Um, I, I'm of the belief that, that, that um, one size doesn't fit all, so that what's right for one individual may not be right for another individual. And uh, although everybody needs coverage of some sort, I believe that strongly in our society, um, I think it's important that the individual uh, ought to be able to select that process. And I'll give you an example. Um, I served on the Ways and Means Committee when I was in the House of Representatives for a number of years, one of the health committees in, in Congress. Uh, on the House side, one of the three health committees. And, and uh, Secretary Sebelius, who was then uh, uh, secretary at HHS, came to the committee and she, she testified on a number of things. And, and throughout that testimony and in, in my conversations with her, I was, began to be more concerned, as I am with some individuals uh, it, it, at the federal level, that they had a sense that, 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 um, that people weren't capable of really making decisions about how health care ought to be paid for in this nation uh, and how it ought to be delivered. And so I asked her the question, and I'm afraid that she thought it was impertinent at the time, and I didn't mean it as such, but I asked her the question. I said, Madam Secretary, it, it, do you believe that, that one free American who has the resources and desire of purchasing a service ought to be able to do so with another free American who has the expertise in education and training to provide that service outside of the construct of a government rule. Um, and there was this long pause and she said, well, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, and I thought that was really telling about where some individuals have a sense about what this financing of healthcare will look like. So it's a long way of saying, I think that we obviously need to get everybody covered. We need everybody to have coverage. Some individuals, that coverage because of the resources or lack of resources that they have will of necessity come from other entities, likely government, federal or state, state government. Um, and other individuals uh, uh, want and are, uh, are able to uh, either have coverage through their employer, and that's a different mechanism of financing, uh, or, th or through themselves uh, purchasing the kind of coverage that they want. So um, uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's an array of, of, uh, of, of ways in which we ought to allow for health to be purchased in this nation. Well, that highlights the complexity of our sure. system, and I want to follow up on each of those different ways of purchasing health insurance or being covered. So you, you talked about the probable necessity of having some redistributive component for low-income people. It's going to be some other program, like sure. Medicaid or for older populations, Medicare, government programs to ensure some basic level of care. Uh, let me start with a, a question about the basic premise. Do you think that all citizens have a right to a certain level of health care? And if so, what's that level? Yeah, I think that it's, as I mentioned, it's incredibly important that everybody have health coverage. Um, and I've always believed that. Um, I'm a third generation physician. My dad and my granddad were docs. Um, and, and, and there was a time in American medicine when there was cost shifting. So my grandfather, for example, and my father in his early practice, um, when, when, when they knew that somebody didn't have the resources to be able to pay for a service, they, my grandfather was, was either paid in chickens or cords of wood, literally, I remember this as a kid, or not at all, and there was a cost shifting to the individuals that could pay, and those individuals were uh, paid more for their service so that everybody could be covered. It was kind of a social contract that we have had. Now, that wasn't ideal, but it was a way that at that time we tried to figure out and work through how you make certain that everybody has access to care, which is, which is, which is key. 
Um, the challenge right now is that, that, that that's not allowed anymore. That's against the law, as a matter of fact. You can't charge one person more than, a, than, than, than another person. Uh, so we need to make certain that every single individual has access to coverage. The next question has to be, okay, so what kind of coverage is that, and who decides what kind of coverage that is? And that's a, that, that tends to be a place where folks uh, oftentimes split, and they say, well, the, the, there ought to be um, a, uh, the, 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 the state or the federal government ought to be the ones selecting what kind of coverage that is. I would suggest to you that that's not where that decision ought to be made, that that ought to be made with the individual, and that there ought to be an actuarially sound amount of resources that are available to folks that don't have resources so that they're able to determine what kind of coverage that they want. So that sounds like the uh, government would provide a certain floor amount of resources, a check in yeah. essence, for people to then purchase whatever kind of insurance they saw met their needs best with that check. Yeah, and if you, look, if, you, if you want to look at the specifics of it, it was the bill was H.R. 2300. Mm -hmm. It was introduced in the previous Congress, not this one when I was there, and that, and that was the fourth iteration of that piece of legislation that, that, uh, that was Will mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the introduction. Um, and it was, a, it was an attempt to try to define how, you, how, how we as a society can, can get to the point where folks have coverage without having the federal government dictate what that coverage is. So do you think Medicare should move in that direction as well? Uh, I, it, I think that it's important to, to step back and say, well, okay, because I oftentimes get the question, how do, you f how do we fix the healthcare system that we have? Um, okay, answer that question instead. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always amused when I get the question because the, the, the premise of that question presumes that we have a healthcare system. Um, and in fact, we don't. We have healthcare systems. So we have, we have the Medicare system for seniors, we have Medicaid system for those at the lower end of the economic spectrum or who are dis disabled. Uh, we have uh, the exchange system that was set up by the ACA, which is really a, a relatively small portion of our population, although one would think that it was the, the entire, uh, entire population. We have the employer-sponsored system, which provides coverage for the vast majority of Americans, about 160 or 165 million uh, Americans. We have the VA health system. We have the Indian health service. We've got a private system that functions above, beneath, or beside all of that, depending on, on how you describe it. Um, and and we, we somehow expect that patients ought to be able to move seamlessly between some of those systems, um, and we wonder why it doesn't work. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that we, that we have so, so siloed our system now that we have many more complex problems and challenges than we otherwise would if we recognized that the healthcare system ought to be harmonized in, in many, many ways. So for example, if, if you are a senior reaching 65, and I'm almost there, but, but why should the society say that you must go off of your current coverage that you have and go on to, to Medicare without any choice in that decision. That may be what you want to do, but it may also be not what you want to do. And if it isn't what you want to do, should we as a society allow you to make a different decision? I would suggest that we ought to allow you to make a different decision and select the kind of coverage that you want. That could be Medicare. It could be something else if that's what you want. And that's, I believe, how we answer the fundamental question of getting the healthcare system to move in the direction that we want it to, which begs the question, what direction do we want it to move in? And I would suggest to you that the direction that we want it to move in is the direction that all of you want it to move in as individual patients. And if you empower patients, then the system by its very nature will move in the direction that patients want it to move, not anybody else. So that sounds a lot like Medicare Advantage, right. where seniors have a choice between the traditional fee-for-service mm -hmm. system and a Medicare Advantage plan that comes with a contribution towards the premium from the federal government, and people get to choose which plan they That's want. Right. Only about a third, uh, thirty percent of Medicare beneficiaries choose Medicare Advantage. Uh, why do you think that is? Two reasons. Uh, one is that the numbers have been limited by, by federal law, to, mm -hmm. so that there's a cap on the on the number of individuals. Uh, that can uh, that can receive uh, Medicare or that are able to select Medicare Advantage, um, and secondly, uh, it it's um, it's an un 
it's an unknown for many folks. So they have a comfort level with Medicare, which is fine, and they ought to be able to select that. Uh, but if they want something that offers a few more choices or a few more options for them, then they ought to be able to select Medicare Advantage. The right percentage for Medicare Advantage, this may surprise you, uh, may surprise some folks, is the percentage of individuals that select Medicare Advantage. It's not a decision that I ought to make. It's not a decision that the chair of the Ways and Means Committee ought to make. It's not a decision that the Secretary of Health and Human Services ought to make. It's a decision that people ought to make. And so 30% right now, I would suggest to you, is the right percentage because that's the number of people that select mm -hmm. it. But it may be more, it may be less next year, depending on what happens. So for the 70% of people in Medicare who are on traditional fee-for-service, uh, we largely, you know, as the name suggests in fee-for-service, they're largely paid based on Correct. detailed price schedules. And there have been some experiments in bundled payments or alternative payment mechanisms to try to move away from paying for quantity towards paying for outcomes or quality or, or bundles of sure. services. Uh, are you a fan of those alternative payment models? I think alternative payment models are important and ought to be incentivized um, and individuals will select them as they are more responsive mm -hmm. to their needs. Um, it's important when we talk about Medicare, um, uh, which is where we, where we are right now, to appreciate that the Medicare system, which is a, has been a wonderful system and has provided coverage for many individuals who uh, uh, otherwise would not be able to have, have that kind of coverage, but financially it's strained. Um, and with, with my generation, the boomers who are aging, 78 million of us, are, have to go through this pipeline of health care and health, health coverage. And the fact of the matter is that unless something is done, then Medicare, you hear people say Medicare goes broke. Well, it doesn't really go broke. It's just not able to fulfill the, response, the, the promises that it has made to seniors at a certain point, not able to fulfill what they have been assured will be there for them from a health provision standpoint. I think that, that for us to sit back and say nothing needs to be done and we'll simply let that happen is irresponsible from our public servants. Um, I also think that it's, that it's important that we, that we try to depoliticize health care because uh, the, the, the conversation that we ought to have ought to be one that says, okay, we want these goals. Most of us want the same kind of goals of a system that's affordable and accessible and of the highest quality. We want these goals. And so how do we get to those goals? And that's where the discussion ought to be. But it ought to be more positive and productive than it tends to be um, in the political arena right now. Well, I want to come back to the fiscal sustainability and how we achieve mm -hmm. that in our public programs. But you, you brought up the political realities of I didn't, making. I didn't answer your question, though. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 Alternative payment models and, 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 and bundling of, 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 uh, of services and, and the like. I, I think it's important that we, mm -hmm. that we try uh, as many different kinds of things that will allow us to adhere to those principles. So we get folks covered, we make it mm -hmm. so that it's affordable, we make it so that the care is of the highest quality and that patients have those choices. And there will be models that will work in that. Mm -hmm. There will be models that won't work. And the individuals that ought to be able to select what's working, again, are the folks in the system itself, patients themselves. Well, so are you suggesting that patients ought to select the model by which their physicians are paid, or that Medicare ought to select payment models, the, the way that it pays for the services that people consume? Both. Medicare uh, ought to be able mm -hmm. to, to uh, uh, pr produce pilots and demonstration pro mm -hmm. projects, which they currently do through a variety of ways. One of the, one of the uh, areas that's housed under uh, uh, HHS is in CMS called the, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid mm -hmm. Innovation, uh, oftentimes called the Innovation Center, mm -hmm. and it has, tr it has uh, tried to incentivize certain different payment models, um, which I think is, is really important. If, if, if you, not that anybody needed to do any research for this, but if you Googled me and you put in bundled payments, you'll find some some uh, sites that, that talk about how I oppose bundled payments. What I'm opposed to is the federal government defining large geographic areas mm -hmm. with large, huge portions of our population and s senior population in Medicare and saying to that population, sometimes up to three quarters of the senior population, this is what you must do if you want to, for example, get your total hip replaced. Mm -hmm. um, you must participate in this system. Um, leaving out any 
opportunity for the patient to, to have a decision in, in that. That to me is not a demonstration. That's not a pilot. That is the federal government determining what care mm -hmm. you will receive as a senior if you live in a certain area. And that, that mandatory bundling, uh, mandatory pilot, mandatory uh, uh, program, I think is not appropriate. However, if it were done as a pilot in a small um, in a geographic area and done voluntarily for both the physicians in, in the area and for patients, and it were proven to demonstrate that it had a higher quality of care, it, it, had, it, had, uh, uh, it was affordable for folks and allowed for, for a greater, uh, better outcomes, then that's a discussion that we ought to have at that point. I haven't seen that system. Well, there, there's a practical challenge there in trying to provide evidence that an alternative payment model like bundled payments make a difference in the care that's delivered, the quality or the value of the care, and allowing it to be voluntary on both sides by saying, if it's, if it's up to individual patients and individual doctors to both opt in, there's a practical reality that only for the cases where it's financially advantageous will people opt into it. And you almost guarantee that you spend more money because the people for whom it's financially advantageous to be in the fee-for-service system choose that. The people who, for whom it's financially advantageous to be in the bundled system choose that. Is that really the way you'd want to test whether the bundled payment would move towards higher quality care? Well, they may or may not. It begs the question, how do you decide um, how to move any scientific uh, proposal of treatment or care in any instance forward. And you do it through a double blind study and you do it through what's called informed consent. So we for decades have had an informed consent process where patients know that they're going into a, 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 a trial. Mm -hmm. uh, they sign and say, yeah, that's okay with me. I, mm -hmm. I, I know I've got this diagnosis. I know that, I'm, that I need some treatment. I know that the treatment that I will receive may be the standard treatment right now or it may be something else and I won't know but I'm so um, uh, anxious to make certain that I'm able to contribute to the broader knowledge for our society mm -hmm. and have access ultimately for all of us to a higher level of care. That's how we do it right now. So why would we look at any other system, any other pro mm -hmm. proposal and say, we want to abandon the for informed consent process that we've gone through for other scientific studies and, and, and stipulate that individuals must do something without their consent. That, that, that to me uh, is, is problematic. And it is so because you mentioned value in healthcare. There's a lot of talk about value in healthcare. And that's important. We all want value in healthcare. We want value in everything, right? You want value in the car that you buy and the clothes that you buy and the food that you eat. Um, now the equation for value, as, as you know, is quality over cost. Value equals quality over cost which means that the definition of quality is really important, really important. And, and this is one thing that, that frustrated me as a physician, uh, a, a formerly practicing physician in the area of, of public policy for ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is that the definition of what quality is for you and the definition of what quality is for me, even for the same diagnosis, may be completely different. So for example, as an orthopedic surgeon, the definition of what quality care is for a 28-year-old who has a hip fracture that's sustained when he or she tumbles down a, a, a ski slope, the quality of care that is, it ought to be provided to that individual is completely different than the quality of care that ought to be provided for the individual who's 82 years old with a hip fracture because he or she falls, has all sorts of other comorbidities, has congestive heart failure, diabetes, and, and is on multiple medications. The quality of care for each of those individuals is different, yet the federal government determines that both of those are exactly the same individual by the coding and the process that we do to review whether or not quality care is provided. That's a system that may work for government, but it doesn't work for patients. And that's the challenge that we have. Well, in thinking about how we move towards a system that has the kind of flexibility and choice that you've been outlining, provides value, that patients perceive as value to them, I, I'm an economist. I focus on these questions. And we could spend a long time sure. talking about measurement of quality, which maybe we can do afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but there are so many uh, aspects of the process by which we end up at the health systems that we have that are harder for me to understand and that I'd love to get your take mm. on. We had Obamacare or the ACA 
under uh, when the Democrats controlled both the legislative branch and the executive branch, there was certainly a lot of discussion of moving towards a broad overhaul of the system, yet we didn't see that broad overhaul even when Republicans had control of the executive and the legislative branches. What do you think interferes with major changes in the healthcare system? I, I think there's a little bit of pessimism that we're gonna see yeah. major changes anytime in the foreseeable future given the uh, absence of even small tweaks to things that people across the political spectrum agree aren't working as they are and could have small technical fixes. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of movement in yeah. the system. Should I be pessimistic about any improvements? No, you ought to always be an optimist because that because optimism fuels hope and full glass, yes. <laughs> full glass. That's right, and 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 uh, uh, and fuels focus on work that mm -hmm. hopefully gets to 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 a solution. I'm a, I'm an optimist uh, about the future of healthcare, and I'm an optimist about the future of the country. Um, but the ch the challenge in healthcare, and it's an important question because the, the, there's not a good consensus around what that that challenge is. I would suggest that they're in the public policy arena or public uh, um, uh, in, in, in folks who are making these decisions, um, that the, the level of, of um, experience about what health care is and what it ought to be is basically from their own experience as a patient as opposed to, to knowledge about, about mm -hmm. the system. Now, people study and learn and they, and they figure out, and there are very, very bright individuals all over the public policy arena at both the state and the federal level who are, work, who are working on health care. But because of how we have made decisions up to this point in this siloed system, we tend to, to view it as, as, as a little fix here and a little fix there and a little fix there and a little fix here. And consequently, we have now, we now find ourselves with a healthcare system that none of us would design if we had the opportunity to, to design a healthcare system. Nobody in this room, I don't care what your philosophy is, if you had a clean slate and said, okay, draw what you think ought to be the ideal healthcare system, you wouldn't come up with anything that even looks, resembles the system we currently have. So uh, what, I, what, what, what I have always tried to do is to find individuals who want to step back and say, okay, let's, we can't wipe the slate, slate clean, but how do we get from here to where we think that ought mm -hmm. to be? And that's why I talk about principles of healthcare. Uh, affordability, quality, uh, um, accessibility, choices, innovation, responsiveness, those principles defining that and then how do we get to there. And let me suggest to you that one of the ways that I think could get bipartisan support um, is, is uh, movement toward a system of voluntary changes in the system itself by the people in the system. So what does that mean? That means, as you mentioned earlier, if an individual on Medicare wants to remain with their private coverage that they have before, their mm -hmm. personal, or they're, they're still working and they want to remain with their employer-sponsored co mm -hmm. coverage, then they ought to be able to voluntarily do so. Nobody ought to tell them what to do. They ought to be able to select that. But if you take that to the other systems, then that means that the individual on Medicaid ought to be able to remain on Medicaid or ought to be able to move to a different system of their choosing. Individuals in the VA system right now, there's a, there's a movement right now to have mm -hmm. choice in the VA system, moving folks from the VA health care system to a different system if they so desire. Same ought to be true in the Indian Health Service. Same ought to be true in the exchanges, for example. If, you want, if you're on the exchange and you want to move to, to another system that may work better for you, then voluntarily you ought to be able to do that. And the reason I think that the voluntary nature of it is so important it, it is because then you do indeed empower people to select where the system moves. And that, that ought to, I think that ought to be uh, uh, one of the hallmarks of any changes that we have. Should people be able to opt out of being insured altogether? Uh, it's, it's a great question. I don't think that, that if there are products that actually make sense for them, some, many of the young folks in this room are, are oftentimes the focus of that discussion. Um, uh, they're they're occasionally um, derisively called the young immortals, right? You don't believe anything is ever going to happen to you. You're healthy. You don't think you ever need coverage. Is that right? Does that mean, uh, or, or what's offered to you isn't worth the price that they're, they're charging you, right? That's oftentimes the case. So the, the cost benefit that, that, that young folks, healthy folks see in terms of what is available to them doesn't make any sense. And so millions of individuals in this nation over the past couple of years have paid a penalty for the privilege not to get health coverage. 
millions of individuals in this nation have paid a penalty for the privilege not to get health coverage. Now that may seem like, seem like a crazy system and I would suggest to you that it is a crazy system and it's a system that doesn't work for people. So if we've got this system that, that, that forces, I'll use that word, six million or so folks to pay a penalty so that they don't have to purchase coverage, we ought to step back from that and say, wait a minute, <laughs> this may have seemed like a good idea on the drawing board, but it really isn't a very good idea because you got folks paying money, hard-earned money out of their pockets so they don't have to have health coverage. Why don't we allow them to take that money and buy something that might actually be responsive to them and, and, and appropriate for them? Many of those individuals would, some of them would need a subsidy, mm -hmm. there's no doubt about it, but many of those individuals, I believe, would buy a policy that works for them if that policy were available to them to purchase, and that's where the rub comes. And if they didn't, that would be okay or not okay? I, you know, I, I, I think that folks ought to be covered, and I think that, that if you make it financially wise and feasible and mm -hmm. foolish for them not to be covered, then the vast majority of individuals will have coverage, and when they don't, H.R. 2300, if you go back and look at it, shows how people, when they access the system, would default into a coverage policy. So one way or another, they get covered to, yeah. by default or otherwise. Yeah. So uh, should we be looking to CMS, to Congress, to the states, to take concrete action to move us towards a more responsive system? Um, anybody under the age of 30 in this room, we ought to be looking to you. Um, because you're the ones that are, that, that, that are going to solve this, uh, the, the, this challenge. And hopefully you'll solve it before the financial challenge gets so great that it, it is almost insoluble um, because uh, uh, that, that, that time is coming. Um, as I said, I'm, 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 I'm frustrated by the politicization of, of health care. I've been in that arena and so know how easy it is to politicize. Um, and, and, and some of the, uh, um, uh, some of the frustration I had with, with my own activity was that, that, that it became a political battle uh, as opposed to a collegial conversation and discussion about, about how things ought to occur. Uh, coming from the, the, the healthcare arena, um, I was oftentimes asked, what's the difference, what's the biggest difference between politics and medicine? And, uh, um, and I used to, to uh, share with folks that when I walked into the operating room, I knew that the end, that everybody in that room was working for one goal, that we were working to get that patient well. Um, and it was a team effort to be able to do that. In the world of politics, um, at least half the folks are looking to see you dead, um, if not literally, then figuratively. And, <laughs> And the other half, you're not so certain about. So uh, um, it, 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 it was so different. And that's why I often, that's why I try to hearken back to the scientific method of decision making and, and, and solutions. Because uh, that, that was my training. It was, it was how I was, was, uh, uh, was educated as a physician. And it actually gets you to, mm -hmm. most often, the right answer. And that scientific method, as most of you will know, is, is that, you, that you have a hypothesis, you figure out, you get as, gain as much information as you can, both objective and subjective. You put forward a, a, a plan of action, a proposal to, to, to try to figure out how to treat this, this problem that you have, this diagnosis that you've got. And then you measure whether or not you're moving in the right direction. And if you're not moving in the right direction, then you change, and sometimes you change rapidly, and sometimes you change over a period of time. Uh, until you, you get things moving in the right direction. The political world has no nimble nature at all in that changing. So Medicare is my, you, I mean, it has so many examples about this that you could go on and on and on, but the biggest one that I point to that, that happened just a few years ago is the prescription program within Medicare, Medicare Part D. It took Medicare 40 years, 40 years, to determine that it might be appropriate for seniors to have access to medications to treat their diseases. That's a system that's not nimble or flexible. Um, so when something is gonna take that long, then, then the solution has to come oftentimes from the private sector, but oftentimes from individuals who are engaged in new ways and, and, and creative ways. So what about the states as laboratories for Medicaid? Uh, it, it, it's a, it, the states, 
being the laboratories of democracy, as, as have they been uh, d described. Um, we ought to provide a lot of flexibility, I believe, as a society, as a nation, to allow states the flexibility to, uh, to, to try out new programs. It, it, one of the things that, uh, uh, that is currently being uh, proposed uh, through a potential rule coming out of the Department of Labor is an opportunity for not just states, but for localities to try different ways to address the issue of the individual and small group market insurance and those folks who are, uh, don't have ability to pool with larger groups of folks to lower the cost and spread the risk for the purchase of their coverage to, to, to pool together, whether it's in states or whether it's in, in regions or whether it's across state lines. They're called association health plans and it's an exciting, I think one of the things that could be, again, voluntarily a solution for folks to gain coverage. Uh, do you think that the association health plans where people can buy coverage across state lines uh, in any way undermines in the laboratory aspect of states in making their own regulatory regimes or their own payment policies if people can opt out by picking policies from other states? No, because if you allow the choice, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the decision making, the authority, the power mm -hmm. in that equation to be with the individual, mm -hmm. then if the states are doing them something that's more responsive and better than what's offered through the association health plans, mm -hmm. then that's where people will go. Mm -hmm. And that's where we ought to allow them to, to, uh, to, to make that decision. Right now there's a whole, um, you know, you, you wonder why there are people that tend to sit on the sidelines in these conversations often, and large business is one of them that has tended to sit on the sidelines in the discussion about the ACA. Um, and it's primarily because they aren't terribly affected, because the, they're regulated under the federal uh, rule of ERISA, uh, uh, the self-insured plans that are out there, and, and those plans tend not to be governed by the ACA at all. And so they're kind of over here looking at, at, at uh, the exchange market and saying, aren't, aren't we uh, glad that we don't have to subject ourselves to all of those things because that would make it more difficult for us to provide coverage for our employees. And so, again, as I mentioned, the self-insured uh, uh, plans are the ones that are, are covering the vast majority or, or a significant majority of the American people and they tend to work, there are some flaws with it, they, but they tend to work relatively well. Most employees are relatively content with the coverage that they have, but those who work for small employers under, under 50 employees don't have access to those things, and that's what the Association of Health Plans is trying to do, to level the playing field between large business and small business. And we do see some interesting innovation coming out of employers, particularly larger employers right. in terms of employee wellness or in terms of the types of insurance plans they're offering. There's certainly been a lot of discussion about the Amazon partnership mm -hmm. and how that might affect healthcare offerings. What are some of the innovations that you see coming out of the private sector, whether it's employer coverage or other innovative delivery that you think are most promising? There's, um, uh, there's, there's something that's really exciting going on and it's a revolution in healthcare right now and some of you likely have possess it currently and it's measuring something on you as we speak. And that's all the uh, artificial intelligence and the wearables that exist right now. There's a great book that I would uh, commend to you if you have any interest in this area by Eric Topol, T-O-P-O-L, who's a physician who's written a lot about um, uh, 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 what he calls the democratization of medicine or the democratization of, of healthcare and what's happening in, in information, access to information that we all have, many of us uh, uh, utilize, that is empowering people to know so much more about their health status and to, to measure. Uh, uh, aspects of their health status in real time and then communicate that to their provider and have uh, that individual be able to then make a decision on that. Now, you, early on your question was about the financing of health care. Mm -hmm. The question is how do we make that so that it works in the financing of the system? Uh, there are some, some ways to do that, I believe, but I think there will be more creative and innovative ways that will incentivize that. But the, the, this, this revolution that is truly going on in the area of healthcare is, I find, really exciting and, and uh, um, more creative minds than, than, than mine will be able to figure out all the great things that will be going on out there. And we ought to allow that. We ought to incentivize that. We ought not one of the concerns that I have is that as this gets, gets greater traction that, that the government will say, okay, now we need to regulate it. We need to dictate what it is that you can have and what you can't have because of X. Um, and I believe that that would be harmful to the quality of health that all of us desire for ourselves and our families. 
and that that does open up a whole new set of possibilities for how we deliver healthcare on the patient side. Uh, drawing on your experience right. as a physician, do you see that also helping to inform the physician decision-making process? How's technology playing out in how doctors practice medicine? Yeah, this is this is ex really exciting as well because um, there 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 are so many resources that are at the, the fingertips of patients, but they're also at the fingertips of, of physicians and, and other providers. And, and uh, you can't always be perfect, and so in a, in a, in a, uh, in, in a system that is trying to, per, to assist your health, we ought to, to, to allow for as many assistive devices, if you will, for the folks providing the care so that you get the highest uh, uh, level of care. Uh, Michael Lewis is, a, is, is an author that some of you may know. He wrote uh, The Big Short and, and uh, um, uh, Moneyball and, and, and uh, a, a number of different books. His most recent book, and I always mess this title up, but I think it's called The Up, Unend Upending Project? Undoing Project, The Undoing Project. It, 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 another, another great read in that there's a portion on healthcare where, where uh, there were a couple of folks that, that, that looked at uh, different gastroenterologists, uh, stomach doctors, uh, stomach and intestine doctors, how they treat stomach cancer. And they took simply the information that those physicians told them about how they diagnose and then treat patients with gastric cancer. And then they prospectively looked at patients that came in their offices and in their practices that had gastric cancer and evaluated whether or not the physicians themselves did what they said they were that they believe was the right thing to do in terms of either diagnosing or treating the patient. And in the majority of the time, they didn't do everything that they said was the right thing to do for a variety of reasons. You know, they, 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 they forgot, they woke up on the wrong side of the bed, they didn't think it was appropriate, they didn't ask the question that needed to be asked in order to, to, to uh, derive that, that, that tidbit of information that would then lead them in that direction. So if we only simply took information that are currently in the provider's heads and allowed for our, that, 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 that nexus between their seeing the patient and that information in real time, then we would see a significantly greater improvement, I, I would suggest, in the quality of care that's being provided. Imagine, if you will, um, getting the, the world experts on this disease or that disease to be able to have in real time access to information for you or me or anybody else when they're being treated for something and make certain that that indeed uh, occurs. Again, you've got to, you've got to struggle with the financing of how you make that happen, but that's what we all want, isn't it? We all want our doctors to have, the, uh, to have access to the highest level of information so that you, me, everybody gets the highest quality of care available. Well, I have so many more questions for you, but so do a lot of people yeah. in the audience. And we'll turn to some audience questions now. And I remind you that the first three questions ought to be from students. And I turn to the mic. Hi, Dr. Price. I am Doc Strahant, a first year at the University of Chicago from San Francisco Bay Area. Great. And my question to you is this. Even though you mentioned that everyone ought to have health care, you supported passing of the American Health Care Act, which was estimated to cause more than 20 million people to lose their health coverage. Why did you support that bill? Yeah, this is, this is really a, um, a, a great question because it allows for the opportunity to, one, talk about the Congressional Budget Office and how they score bills, how they determine, predict the, the, the future, and the models that they use, and Dr. Baker knows a whole lot more about this than, than, than I, uh, but uh, they, they, they looked at a silo of information. I talked about the silo of, of health care, but they look at a silo in, of information and do so uh, devoid of any other activity that's occurring out here. So when you talk about it, when one talks about a specific piece of legislation, that's not everything that whoever votes for that or against that is, is either for or against. There are all sorts of other things that are going on out here in the policy world that, 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 that are really important to discuss. So when I, when I opposed the ACA, which I did strongly and vehemently, I did not because I didn't uh, um, respect or appreciate the goals, which were to provide greater access for individuals, I did so because I thought that the, the, the goals, the, the, the manner in which they brought around about that greater access were actually harming the ability for individuals to afford care and harming the ability for individuals in many instances to gain access to the quality care or the choices that they desired for their care. 
So when you weigh these things in, a, in, a, uh, uh, in, in an isolated instance of a specific piece of legislation, as policymakers, you have to make a decision. Does this move us more in the right direction or more in the wrong direction? And that's a, that's a, that's a judgment call. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Lynch, a second year in the college. I'm actually from the 6th District, Dunwoody. Good. So it's great to hear you here today. Thanks. Did you go and, to Dunwoody High? Yeah. Great. <laughs> and uh, my question is, given that the Medicaid expansion appears to be remaining in place on a federal level for some time, do you think it would be harmful to George for Georgia to take the 9 to 1 matching funds to expand Medicaid in Georgia and cover the 300,000 people that remain uninsured there? Yeah, Medicaid expansion and the individual mandate were the two big bugaboos that, that, that were present last summer in the debate about what to do with repeal, what was called repeal and replace. Um, and and uh, what I tried to, to help folks uh, get to a point where they could appreciate is that if, if, if they removed those two things from the table, then there was pretty good consensus about what to, to do, where, what, what, what the next steps in terms of reform ought to be. But, but we were unable to, to, to make that happen. In terms of Medicaid expansion, um, I, I think it's incredibly important, again, as I mentioned, that everybody be covered. Um, so whether it's in Medicaid or not, um, the, the area, the location where those choices ought to be, I believe, ought to rest with the individual. So I've supported Medicaid expansion for states that do so in a way that provide for that flexibility and voluntary nature of what kind of coverage it is that they have, as opposed to dictating to folks what, they, what, what, what kind of coverage they, they, they ought to receive. Um, that being said, Medicaid is a system that, that uh, in its, in its original intent was designed as a safety net for uh, um, healthy moms, kids uh, of, of low income, seniors of low income, and disabled. Um, and when we move to, and, and so the, the, the coverage for most many states is up to about 100% of the federal poverty level. What Medicaid expansion did was then cover those individuals between 100% and 138% of, of the federal poverty level. And that's a, that's a reasonable thing to talk about and to propose if your goal is, is, is coverage. Um, I would suggest to you that what, one of the byproducts of that decision, and as we talked about it at the time, is that you, we now have in the Medicaid population um, individuals who are healthy who are actually squeezing out the ability for those in that vulnerable population to either receive care or the, the provider community is incented to see the healthier individuals because they're paid more for the healthier individuals than for the, for the, for the folks at the lower end of the economic spectrum. That's a system, again, that I suggest may work for government, may work for the insurance company or the third-party administrator that's doing it, but it doesn't necessarily work for patients. So should Georgia do that? Georgia ought to come up with a program, and it may be that, it may be something that ensures that all of their citizens, as every other state does, should, uh, all of their, their citizens are able to gain coverage to health care, for health care. Thank you. Hello. Hey. Um, my name is Amr Hussain. I am a joint degree student in the School of Medicine and the School of Public Policy. Great. I'm entering dermatology. And my question for you is, the AAMC projects a shortage of 120,000 physicians yeah. by the year 2030. And as a fellow specialist, do you see a tension between promoting more access to primary care and access to specialist services. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm the product of one of those tensions uh, that has occurred. I, I, uh, I'm an, I'm an, uh, my son calls me an old fart, so I'm, I'm, I'm one of those ancient guys that uh, I graduated from high school in 1972. When I graduated, I was admitted to an a, um, a, a undergraduate and a medical school program at the same time, so an accelerated program at the University of Michigan. Um, and the goal of that program was to get folks in the program and incentivize them to become primary care doctors, because even back then we were, as a society, concerned about a, a, a decreasing number of primary care physicians. The problem was that they took, except for me, they took all these bright young kids and put them into a program who finished, and then when they got out and they selected their residency, virtually none of them selected primary care. They all wanted the whiz-bang stuff that had all the toys and, 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 the, and the new innovative stuff. Um, so the, the, the program didn't, didn't meet its goal. The program no, no longer exists. But what we've done as a society it, is to incent individuals to move into prim, to, to specialty care as opposed to, to primary care. So yeah, uh, uh, we've got a huge shortage right now of physicians, somewhere between 50 and 100,000, depending on who you, 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 you look at and listen to. 
And one of the reasons that we have that shortage, I would suggest, is because of public policy, federal decision-making policy, that caps the number of residency slots that are available out there. And it does so, so we, th so we don't train as many physicians as, as, as we could. In fact, for the first time in, a, in, in I think, the, since the beginning of, of uh, graduate medical education and, the, and the, the residency match, over the past couple of years, there have been hundreds of medical students who graduate from medical school in this country who, who, aren't, who don't match. They don't get a residency program, which means we've got a system that isn't, these are folks that successfully finished medical school. They threw their cap in the air and celebrated and then didn't get a residency slot. That's a waste of resources, waste of intellectual capital, waste of all sorts of things. It's a system, again, that doesn't work for the overall healthcare system. So we ought to, we got to solve the graduate medical education uh, dilemma that we have about the number of residency slots, and we must incentivize individuals to go into primary care, and I think there are a number of different ways that you can do that, not just financial, but from a, a, a regulatory standpoint, from a hassle factor standpoint, from an electronic medical record standpoint, standpoint where you can incentivize individuals to have a, 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 a more hassle-free practice than otherwise exists right now, um, and we ought to do so. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Tom. Hey. John Ruane. John, good to see you. I want to talk about Medicaid, too. Yeah. Um, under the ACA, record numbers of uh, enrollees came in. People who were dying in their homes were now getting care. Here in Cook County, uh, they've done wonderful work here, um, identifying high utilizers taking patients out of the ER and out of the hospitals, the clinics to get proactive care. It's all positive. It reduces money. It helps patients. It's quality care. But during your battle, and you were in the front of that biggest battle, right, um, it seemed the government was fighting against all of that, looking to just hand out block grants. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I, I, when you have success stories like that, they ought to be they ought to be trumpeted. They ought to be highlighted and and be banner headlines about who's doing what well and and then be best practices. Um, and that's the goal for for providing state flexibility or local flexibility for these programs because there will be the, the cream will rise to the top and there will be folks who figure out how to do this, especially even in difficult populations to 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 care for and and, and treat. And those are the those are the programs that we ought to say okay. Um, Chicago's doing this in a, in, a, in, a, in a positive way. Illinois is doing this in a positive way. How about uh, you know, the, the, the challenge that they've got in Arkansas, the challenge that they've got in another state, um, uh, using this as an example, and then incentivizing individuals to share that information. Um, so that's what we tried to do from a state flexibility standpoint was to incentivize the kind of creative solutions that states are, are, are doing out here. It's a it, 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 difficult task to, 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 to do so and, and then allow for that, that transfer of, of, of information, expertise, to, to move over to another, uh, another geographic area and be utilized. Well, I agree with you. And County Care with Medical Home Network is doing it here, and yeah. I hope it does, uh, the light has shined on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Dr. Price. Hey. Thanks for the time today. Thank uh, you. My name is Andrew Hyman. I'm a first year here at Booth, uh, and I also have a question about Medicaid block grants. Um, during the repeal debate about the ACA, there was a lot of talk of um, instituting block grants for Medicaid, which would improve choice, flexibility, and ultimately help reduce the cost of care. Uh, my question is why, when Republicans propose this plan, do they not just maintain funding levels as is to avoid the political pushback for cutting health care spending for the poor? Uh, it's a great question. And if you look at, there was an attempt to do that. It's called the Graham-Cassidy bill. Uh, if you look, and, and it's, it still uh, exists, so you can, you, can, you can go online and look at it. It was an attempt to take all of the federal resources that go to a given state um, and take them at the current level plus, actually plused up that, that money, for, for Medicaid, for uh, DISH payments, for disproportionate share uh, for payments, uh, for uh, Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, and for the exchanges. And, and uh, allow the states then to utilize that money. They had to utilize it for health care for covering those populations. They couldn't, they couldn't divert it for something else, but to give them the flexibility to be able to use that. And that even had a, pl a plus up for folks. Now the challenge is, is that when you, when you get with the Congressional Budget Office, which was the, the, one of the first questions that was asked, Congressional Budget Office looks at that and says over the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the budget window, if you will, there isn't any way that that can be sustained and therefore dings the system uh, uh, for it. Um, and, and that's, so you're, 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 you're taking as your metric uh, something that actually doesn't necessarily 
reflect the actual positive nature of the program. And, and so it, it fell uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, but that's not the least of it. But th that, you, you, you're, you're spot on. I mean, that's exactly what, what could be done uh, to, to get us out of this, this incredible gutter that we're in of not being able to move forward from a policy standpoint on programs that, that are, are, are moving in a direction that will not allow them to provide the care and, and the services to the individuals that have been promised. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Hey. Uh, my name is Dan Snow. I'm a first year MPP student at Harris. Um, and my question to you is, uh, you suggested that empowering patients will allow them to select insurance plans that better meet their needs. Um, but how can you expect patients to choose the optimal health plan, given the complexity of the modern healthcare market and their relative lack of information compared to doctors and medical professionals? I'm not saying that patients can't make the informed choices, but the complexity of the system makes that incredibly difficult. Yeah, and, and, and it's a good question. Um, if, if you just drop folks into this overnight, um, then the likelihood of them making wise decisions isn't great. Uh, you're right. Um, however, people make wise, complex, difficult decisions in their lives all the time. Sometimes they make the right decision, sometimes they make the wrong decision, but they make, they make decisions. They figure out how to do that. We're 40 plus years into an experiment uh, that, that says that folks don't need to know anything about how this healthcare system works and what's available to them. And we expect them overnight to, to know what this healthcare system has and what's available to them. It's not gonna happen. So we have trained a whole generation or two that doesn't make any difference what something costs. That doesn't make any, in healthcare, it doesn't make any, you don't have to worry about what something costs. You don't have to worry about what's available to you. You don't have to worry about X or Y or Z because somebody else is gonna make that decision. I would simply suggest to you that when, as, as we move down that road, that that somebody else that's making that decision may not be making the best decision for you. And I would trust you to make that decision better if you have the information, which gets to the transparency that is so incredibly necessary in our system that doesn't exist right now. We don't have, you don't have transparency in the pricing system. You don't have transparency in the cost system. You don't have transparency in, in, uh, in, in the availability of services. Um, you don't have transparency in the alternatives that are available to you, the options that are available to you if, you're, if your physician or provider doesn't, doesn't share them. That's why this, this, this revolution that's going on in information is so incredibly exciting because your generation will be one of the most informed, if you desire and are then allowed by that empowerment to be able to make decisions, you will have so much more information than my generation ever even dreamed about having access to. So I trust people. Uh, if, if you set up a system that you, that you allow for uh, uh, responsible individuals to make decisions and you incentivize them making those decisions, they'll get there. Can I follow up on that real quick? Sure. Okay. Um, so given high prices and relative lack of information that patients have, why would you expect providers to increase their transparency and presumably lower prices well, you got, without regulation? You've got to require them. You've got to require the transparency. So you do believe that we should have increased regulation on providers to require transparency? You've got to have smart regulation. I don't believe in no regulation. Good gracious, you know? I mean, you've got to, you've got to make certain that, 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 that folks have access to a, 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 a standard level of care, of coverage. Uh, you, don't want, you, 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 don't want, you don't want folks to buy stuff that, doesn't, that isn't health coverage. I mean, that's, that, that, that's a canard that's out there from, from my friends on, on, some of my friends on the other side who say the price you're out of your ever-loving mind. You don't care if folks buy, buy, what do they call them? Trash policies or, or I can't remember what they call them. But uh, that's just not true. I, 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 I spent over 25 years of my life caring for people, worried about whether or not they were gonna be able to, to afford the kind of services that were necessary. And when they weren't, how do we, how do we make certain that they can get the, the care that they need, uh, e even if they can't afford it? Um, so the, the, the when, when, when you, on either side, the left or the right, when you hear somebody say that somebody in this system doesn't care about something or, or, or wants people to, to have some terrible outcome for themselves, again, on the left or the right, you ought to virtually dismiss that. First, you ought to do your own research and your own, and your own investigation. But there aren't, most individuals in the public policy arena are of goodwill. They want to solve these things. Um, and and, uh, and the, 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 the sad, one of the, as I mentioned before, one of the sad things that I see right now is that the level of political discourse is so low 
is so low that we're not talking about possibilities and dreams and creative solutions and those kinds of things. We're, 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 we're bypassing all of that. And it's to, to your detriment, to, to the next generation's detriment, if we can't have those, those creative, robust, yes, sometimes contentious, yes, but positive solution-oriented discussions about public policy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kavya. I'm a first-year medical student. Yeah, great. Um, Congratulations. What do you want to do? Um, maybe psychiatry. Yeah. We'll see. Um, I've got a place in Washington that needs a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll come check it out. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, the you kind of referenced that we have a very siloed system. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhat in a negative way, I'm assuming. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, like, the government still funds such a big portion of our health care, but they cover some of the sickest patients, and they have less bargaining power than a lot of private big corporations and insurance companies. So how, how do we get to a place um, where you know, we're going to have an efficient system. Because if we were talking about any business, yeah. that's never a way to efficiency. And then we're surprised that that's right. some of the government um, uh, insurances aren't as efficient or effective. So how, how do we get to a place where government uh, insurance can be effective, given those scenarios? Yeah, I think it's uh, transparency is one of them, wherever the fellow was that asked about the, about the transparency uh, um, issue. Uh, but it's also empowerment of the patients uh, in, in, in the system. Uh, so if patients actually have, have a stake uh, in, in uh, have an opportunity to be empowered in the system so that they're the ones that are, are selecting. And let me give you an example. If you, none of you except for some folks with a little, little more white hair than, than, than we used to have uh, in this room uh, may not have any challenge. But if you go to your doctor and your doctor says, um, I think it's important that you have this test. And, and for most individuals right now, if you, the, the next step is for somebody to call the insurance company and say, can Mrs. Jones have this test? And if, Mrs., and if the insurance company decides that Mrs. Jones can't have that test or shouldn't have that test, then, then where are we? What happens next? Well, the doctor jumps up and down and spits and sputters, or his office does, his or her office does, or the patient calls the insurance company and says, um, uh, my doctor believes I ought to have this test. You say I don't need it. What am I to do now? And the insurance company basically says, um, you don't have any power in this equation. Find somebody who does. And that oftentimes, for, in, uh, for the self-insured uh, uh, companies, the, the larger companies, that's the human resources officer in that company, or it's the, 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 the president of that company or the chair of that, that, that company. Um, but those individuals don't have the same stake as you do in your health. So if we were to empower individuals, and how do you do that? You do that by making certain that every single person, this is the Empowering Patients First Act, every single person owns their coverage regardless of who's paying for it. So then when, the, when you have that conversation with the insurance company, then she, the insurance company has to listen to you because you've got power at that next open enrollment period, you can move that, that money that power wherever, regardless of where it's coming from. And that's how you engage folks in a way that, that, make, that brings about that dynamic market. Sorry, follow up, but yeah. we're talking about people who don't necessarily have that safety net to just move on over to a private insurance. Like they are in government sponsored insurances. So you can't just demand of the government that you change your policies. Um, so, ha you know, I'm talking on like a systemic level how are we going to make it more equal or able for the government to be providing good care when we don't have any bargaining power and healthiest patients are sometimes going to the private insurances? If, if, uh, if every single individual in Medicare, for example, had the opportunity to, to voluntarily move to a different program if they wanted, paid for in the same way by the government, because that's the promise that we've made to seniors, and we made that voluntary, then, then I would suggest to you in a creative way that, that it would revolutionize Medicare in a positive way and make it so the system would be much more responsive to the individual seniors. Hi, Dr. Price. Hey. My name is Bill, first year in college. Um, given, the, uh, given your background as an orthopedic surgeon, I wonder, 
uh, like a rising uh, disruptive technology such as 3D printing, mm -hmm. what are the feasibilities of technologies like this? And what are the implications of say 3D printing for the healthcare insurance space and also sort of the legislative, uh, legislative space? Well, I don't know a whole lot about 3D printing, but I do know that it is beginning to revolutionize what's going on in healthcare with precision types of devices that are being, um, uh, being modeled for a, a specific patient. Um, so, for example, uh, I, when, when I would do a hip replacement, I had my, so my choice of a finite number of, of, of hip prostheses to utilize for a patient, and I used the one that came closest to fitting that patient. And the vast majority of the time, it was very successful. Uh, but I have to believe that the, the more precise we can get in healthcare, and when we're able to, which is very, very soon, uh, to, to fashion a prosthesis or a medical device, uh, an implantable medical device for an individual that is specifically for that individual, how exciting is that? Uh, we're, we're on the cusp of having the most incredible revolution in healthcare. The ability to, to, to mitigate human suffering and cure disease in ways is that I never dreamed about. How exciting is that? Those of you going into medicine, you, you ought to be jumping up and down for joy. You're going into uh, to, uh, uh, an opportunity to be able to help your fellow man and human being in ways that folks have never even dreamed about. Really exciting stuff. So I believe the, the, the 60,000 foot view of your question is we ought to incentivize that kind of innovation and creativity out there as opposed to uh, tamp it down. And we need a system, we ought to have a system that, that, that provides that incentivization. Thanks. Uh, hi, Dr. Price. Hey. I'm a fourth year economics student in the college, um, and I'll be starting medical school next year. Um, Where so are you going to school? Uh, Mayo Clinic. Good job. Um, thank you. Um, so we talked a lot about um, bundled payments and sort of alternative payment models, but one thing we didn't touch on is um, macro, which was huge overall of how we reimburse physicians, yep. and it was bipartisan. Um, and it was really interesting to hear that you started out as a solo practitioner. Um, so my question is, uh, with MACRA and increased consolidation across the sort of healthcare landscape, um, with really more onerous quality reporting requirements for pr providers, um, so say eight, ten years from now when I'm done with medical school, will I be able to become a solo practitioner like you or am I going to be working for the Kaisers or United Health Systems? And what are sort of the pros and cons of consolidation, um, increased quality reporting? Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful question and I hope you're able to do, set up a system of practice wherever it is that you, that, that you want. So if it's in a large multi-specialty group uh, uh, that, you'll, that you'll witness at, at, at Mayo, then, then uh, and that's what you want to do, then you ought to be able to do that. If, if however, you want to go to a community, large or small, rural or urban, and, 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 uh, and set up a practice, I'm hopeful that we will have a system that will allow you to do that. The way that MACRA addressed that was to try to come up with virtual groups so that physicians who are in the onesies and twosies practice could pool together data and information and all be able to uh, uh, be incentivized to provide the highest quality of care. Um, so that's, that was an attempt to try to make it so that the, 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 the mom and pops out there and the small practices, the individual practices, the solo practices that oftentimes provide really high quality care and oftentimes in an area where there isn't other access to, to, to care, that those, that those can survive. The challenge that we have from a federal government standpoint, and you mentioned the, the quality measurements, is that the government tends to, tends to measure, surprise, surprise, things that are easy to measure because they're easy to measure, as opposed to things that are necessarily clinically relevant. So something may be easy to measure and be clinically relevant, for example, post-operative infection. It's a relatively easy thing to measure and, it, and it's clinically relevant. But there are many things that are easy to measure that have no relevance whatsoever on the quality of care that's being provided, yet the federal government requires that you continue to measure them and then sadly makes decisions about how individuals are reimbursed based upon that information that has no correlation with the quality of care that's being provided. So what we ought to push for as a system is identifying those quality metrics, and you don't need a lot of them. You don't need 32 of them, which is what, where we were at one point. You probably need three, four, five, six, maybe for certain diseases you need a, a, a few more. And those quality metrics ought to make a difference. 
to the quality of care that's being provided to the patient, which means that you've got to get complex in this if you want to measure quality. And remember what I said, quality for one patient isn't necessarily quality for another, so you've got to have some measurement that you make that actually trumps, no pun intended, trumps the quality of care that's being provided for one individual defined as the same as, a, as, as another individual because it is of a higher quality for that individual. That's tough to do. Now, the technology exists to be able to do that, but you got, we've got to, as a society, listen to the folks that are actually providing the care so that the metrics that are being judged are actually important metrics and relevant metrics. Thank you. Good luck to you. So we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, people seem to be saying something about themselves, so I'll just tell you that I went through the entire four-year pre-med program and then went to law school and became the black sheep of the family. <laughs> um, but your answer just now plays right into the question I was going to ask, and that is, I, help me with my confusion. You're not really positing a system where the quality of care will be different for, for different people. Don't you mean the level of care? Using the example of the broken hips, uh, both the 82-year-old yeah. and right. the young person, yeah, they, they both get the highest quality. Yes. One may be ICU, the other one doesn't need ICU level of care. Yes. That's no, no you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and the reason that I say quality is because the way the system that we currently have provides the same diagnostic code from a federal government standpoint for both of those individuals and therefore requires that the same quality measures are used for both of those individuals. So, my, so you're actually closing the loop on what I should have said before, and that is that I think it's really difficult for the federal government to define what quality medicine is, for, quality care is for a specific patient. We can define for populations, right. absolutely. Yeah. But for a specific patient, I would suggest it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, which is why those metrics need to be so important. So you're right. It's not quality. It's, it's, and, it's, I, and I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Uh, but everybody is entitled to the highest level of quality. Absolutely. Thank absolutely. You. Dr. Price, my name's Maya. I'm a medical student here at University Great. of Chicago also. Um, my question is in regards to what you bring up, um, empowering patients and patient choice, which I totally believe in. Um, but I want to specifically focus on women's empowerment in their mm -hmm. healthcare choices. Um, so I was wondering, um, specifically in the realm of employer-sponsored healthcare, who should be, who's, who takes precedent? The employer to have the religious freedom to deny birth control coverage to their pay, to their employees under their um, health insurance coverage or the individual employees um, to have full access to the basic reproductive care that all women need? This is a great question because it gets to the heart of who decides. And I really think that that question, who decides, in all of this discussion about health care is, is the paramount question. And I believe that Surprise, surprise, it ought to be the patient that decides, the individual that ought to decide. So if you, if you have that as your principle and as your guide, guiding uh, metric, then the system that I proposed would, would provide for everybody, again, remember, everybody owns their own coverage, so they basically have that coverage and can move that money, even in the self-insured system, to a, to a, a coverage uh, model, a coverage program that works best for them. And so that individual ought to be able to move those resources. If that employer is providing that, that, that coverage, then they ought to be able to provide that coverage for all in a way that allows for flexibility for the individual. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hey, look at this. I, we are on time and under budget. So, <laughs> We're so. certainly under budget. <laughs> So I want to thank Secretary Price for being here and answering all of our questions. I want to thank the IOP for hosting this event and thank all of you for coming and being engaged in this important debate. Thanks to all. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Wonderfully done.